Welcome to iForm Rx, where we examine the evidence that informs ambulatory care pharmacy practice. Today's presentation is regarding the manuscript entitled Tiotropium and Asthma Poorly Controlled with Standard Combination Therapy, which appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in September of 2012. Our reviewer is Roshni Patel, a PGY-2 ambulatory care pharmacy practice resident at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Extra, extra, read all about it. There is new literature to support anticholinergics for asthma. That has been the word on the street for the last few months, and there have been a few practitioners that have proposed the addition of tiotropium to our asthma treatment algorithms. But before we jump on board with this new approach to treating our asthma patients, let's take on the challenge to read and evaluate the literature. Inhaled corticosteroid therapy combined with long-acting beta-2 agonist therapy has been the gold standard for asthma management. For patients whose asthma is not adequately controlled, there have been a few studies that have looked at adding tiotropium to current asthma regimens. Peters and colleagues conducted the first study that looked at this new approach. This study was a randomized controlled trial that showed that the addition of tiotropium was superior to doubling the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid. This study also showed that the addition of tiotropium was not inferior to the addition of salmeterol. These results were seen through measurements in peak expiratory flow, or PEF, and forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1. The second study conducted by Kirstjens and colleagues was also a randomized controlled trial that showed the addition of tiotropium to high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta-2 agonists resulted in significant bronchodilation in patients with severe asthma as compared to placebo. The primary endpoint in this study was measured by FEV1. The final study was conducted by Bateman and colleagues, which again was a randomized controlled trial. This study looked at patients who had a single nucleotide polymorphism at amino acid 16, known as the B16-ARG-ARG genotype. In these patients, beta-2 agonists have been reported not only to be less effective for asthma management, but also their use has been associated with worsening asthma. In this study, when tiotropium was added to inhaled corticosteroids, it was shown to be more effective than placebo and as effective as adding salmeterol in maintaining improved lung function in B16 ARC ARC patients with moderate persistent asthma as determined by PEF values. All three of these studies had a relatively small sample size in addition to a short trial duration. These studies also did not assess exacerbation frequency as an outcome. The Primatine A asthma 1 and 2 trials were replicate randomized double-blind placebo-controlled parallel group trials that included 912 patients. This study set out to evaluate the efficacy and safety of adding tiotropium to standard combination therapy of inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta-2 agonists. Patients were included in the trial if they were between the ages of 18 and 75 and had asthma for at least 5 years. The authors of the article also state that patients needed to be diagnosed with asthma before the age of 40, needed to have persistent airflow limitation, which was defined as a post-bronchodilator FEV1 of 80% or less of the predicted value, and 70% or less of forced vital capacity 30 minutes after the inhalation of salbutamol or albuterol. Patients were required to have had at least one asthma exacerbation in the last year that was treated with systemic glucocorticoids. And finally, patients in the trial were either lifelong non-smokers or had a smoking history of fewer than 10 pack years with no smoking in the year before enrollment. Patients were excluded from the trial if they had a past diagnosis of COPD, had serious coexisting illnesses, or were concurrently using anticholinergic bronchodilators. Patients were randomized to receive either 5 micrograms of tiotropium or placebo via delivery with the soft mist inhaler as add-on therapy to maintenance regimens that consisted of high-dose inhaler corticosteroids and LABA therapy. Continued use of other asthma medications such as theophylline, leukotriene modifiers, 
anti-IgE antibody therapy, and oral glucocorticoids were permitted if the dose remained stable for at least two weeks before study entry and for the duration of the trial. Additionally, all patients in the trial were provided with either salbutamol or albuterol as rescue medication. The primary outcomes of the study included the change in both peak and trough FEV1 response from baseline in addition to the time to first asthma exacerbation. Severe asthma exacerbation was defined as deterioration of asthma necessitating initiation or at least doubling of systemic glucocorticoids for at least three days. Secondary outcomes included peak and trough FEV1 and FVC at each treatment visit and time to first worsening of asthma. This was defined as a progressive increase in symptoms or a decline of 30% or more in the best morning peak expiratory flow for at least two consecutive days. Secondary outcomes also included scores on both the asthma control questionnaire and the asthma quality of life questionnaire. These questionnaires take into account asthma symptoms as reported by the patient in addition to limitations they experience due to asthma. This slide shows the baseline characteristics of the patient population. The mean age of the sample was 53. The median age of asthma onset was 26. But let me point out that the range of asthma onset reported by the authors was anywhere between birth and 44 years of age. This is interesting given the fact that inclusion criteria specifically stated asthma diagnosis needed to occur before the age of 40. Most patients were on long-acting beta-2 agonists and inhaled corticosteroids. In addition, baseline spirometry measures were obtained and are listed on this slide. Let me point out that baseline reversibility was obtained with a mean of 217 milliliters plus or minus 217 milliliters. This suggests that patients could have no reversibility or up to as much as 434 milliliters of reversibility. Most asthma patients will have reversible airway obstruction with a 12% improvement in FEV1 after SABA use. The baseline FEV1 values in this trial suggest that there was only a little over a 7% improvement in FEV1 after bronchodilation. Finally, the calculated FEV1 2 FVC ratio at baseline was a mean of 57.8%. Results of the study showed that after 24 weeks of therapy, the mean change in peak FEV1 three hours after administration of tiotropium was greater in the tiotropium group as compared to the placebo group in both trials. Interestingly, when you look at the numbers, trial 2 shows a greater change from baseline with tiotropium versus placebo as compared to trial 1, although the authors did not comment on this difference between the two trials. With regards to exacerbations, the number of patients who had at least one episode of asthma worsening and at least one severe exacerbation were greater in the placebo group as compared to the tiotropium group, which was statistically significant. For both of those measures, a hazard ratio was reported in the supplementary material of the article without a 95% confidence interval for the hazard ratio. With regards to the number of patients that were hospitalized for asthma, there was no statistically significant difference between the groups. Finally, when looking at the time to first exacerbation, there was a decrease in time by 56 days with tiotropium as compared to placebo, of which the authors stated correlated to a risk reduction of 21% with a hazard ratio of 0.79. Let me point out the confidence interval here ranging from 0.62 to 1.0. So although statistically significant, we cannot rule out that there may have been no difference. Taking a look at the questionnaires that were administered, the ACQ7 questionnaire showed an improvement in scores for both trials, although only trial 2 was statistically significant. Let's quickly review the scoring system for this questionnaire, which you can see on the right side of the slide. The ACQ7 is scored anywhere between 0 and 6, with 0 being no impairment and 6 indicating maximum impairment. In order for there to be a clinically important difference, a half a point difference must be observed, and neither trial showed that. With the AQLQ questionnaire, only trial 2 showed a statistically significant difference, and again, neither trial showed evidence of clinically important improvements in scoring.
The safety data revealed that the incidence of any adverse event was similar between the tyotropium and placebo arms. Allergic rhinitis, however, was more common in the tyotropium group than the placebo group, although the authors did not provide any statistical information to help us determine significance. Additionally, the authors suggested that dry mouth was more common in the tyotropium group than the placebo group. However, the authors reported these results as a composite between tyotropium and placebo, rather than according to each individual trial, and again, there is no statistical information to assess significance. Based on the efficacy and safety presented, the authors of the study concluded that the addition of tyotropium significantly increased the time to first severe exacerbation and provided modest sustained bronchodilation. Now that we know the facts from the trial, we need to ask a few more questions. Firstly, when is it appropriate to recommend anticholinergics for the treatment of asthma? Secondly, why did the tyotropium arm show an improvement in lung function as compared to the placebo arm? Thirdly, what are some of the limitations in the study that we have identified? And finally, how should we be treating uncontrolled patients already on inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta agonist therapy? In order to help us answer these questions, I'd like to introduce our expert panel for a roundtable discussion. Dr. Dennis Williams is the Vice Chair for Professional Education and Practice for the Division of Pharmacotherapy and Experimental Therapeutics. He is also an Associate Professor with the University of North Carolina Eshelman School of Pharmacy. Dr. Mona Sucleris is an Associate Professor with the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. She also is a Clinical Assistant Professor with the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Williams and Dr. Seclaris, for joining the iForum discussion today. Nice to be here. Thank you, Roshni. It's good to be here as well. Let's begin with the first question. When is it appropriate to recommend anticholinergics for the treatment of asthma? The current literature suggests that they have only a limited role in treating asthma and specifically in the setting of the emergency department. Given the results of this new trial, do you think there is an expanded role for anticholinergics? I agree with the role being limited to patients in the emergency department. This most recent paper, and a paper also in the New England Journal from 2010 that evaluated the role of teotropium uh, added to inhaled steroids compared to some other common treatments, also gives us uh, some information about maybe an emerging role for anticholinergics in patients with asthma. One thing that we see in actual patients, especially adult patients with asthma, is that these patients often don't have pure asthma, and based on some of their history, including possibly a history of cigarette smoking in the past, they could actually have a mixture of asthma and COPD, and those patients obviously might be very good candidates, and we might see improvements in their asthma symptoms through the use of a anticholinergic. The other thing I would say about that is that, you know, the National Asthma Guidelines are in dire need of updating. Clinicians are left with these papers and their assessment of these papers to decide when to implement these because we don't get any guidance from our uh, expert guidelines. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I think that one of the things that we need to think about, again, is, is the fact that you do have patients with mixed disease. And as a pediatric practitioner, we don't see people with COPD. And in fact, that's one of the things that I would really like to see some more data before we see too much changed with the guidelines in terms of seeing people that really do have pure asthma in the adult population. I think people with a combined disease would also be very good candidates, I think, for consideration for off-label use for asthma. But I think there you're, you're probably really treating the COPD more than the asthma. So the next question that we need to ask is, why did this trial in fact show an improvement in lung function as compared to the placebo arm? And are there any limitations of this study that we have identified? I think we have a pharmacologic reason in this case to know why teotropium might be useful in this subset of patients. If we think a little bit about physiologically what's happening in the airway, I think bronchomotor tone is dictated by the cholinergic nervous system. So, you know, we know there's some possible benefit there and the effects of teotropium on various muscarinic receptors might be exhibited as this improvement in lung function. 
I think it'd be useful, as I mentioned, to have a clinical trial that has age restrictions for adults to try to tease out patients that are likely not to have COPD. And that might be done through studying patients that are between 18 and 35 to ensure that we're really evaluating the asthma and not COPD drug response. And although the investigators did seem to attempt to restrict patients to COPD by their exclusion criteria, the presence of fixed airway obstruction really was an entry criterion for inclusion in this study. So I think that makes it more difficult to extrapolate to the general asthma population. I think the recommendation about looking at a different age group of patients would answer a lot of questions that are left unanswered by this particular study. 75% of the patients were non-smokers. That leaves 25% that were former smokers. Those spirometry parameters definitely are a bit disturbing, even though the investigators try to make the case that, as you say, these patients really do look like uh, asthma patients. You know, it's interesting, they picked the one feature of asthma, which is fixed airflow obstruction, which could be attributed to remodeling. It's the most controversial. If you delve into the literature about remodeling and whether people actually have irreversible airflow obstruction, the guidelines kind of walk on the thin line about whether or not that's something that really happens in asthma. But it was certainly evident in this particular patient population. And again, it could be because maybe patients were older and maybe they did have some features of COPD. In some ways, I think they try to make a suggestion that these patients are on what we would consider optimal therapy for many patients but still having exacerbations, and they're making the case a little bit that maybe it's because they have this feature of remodeling that we don't see across all patients with asthma. If we did, then we would have a bunch of asthma patients who were severely disabled. So I think that the way they screen the patients and what it took to get into the study does limit the applicability in some cases. If we look, the study was also done in largely a Caucasian population, and so I think that limits some of our application. I think that monitoring for adherence, to me, is also a big concern and a shadow of what occurred in the SMART trial with regard to the patient use of usual therapy. And as a result, in that study, we couldn't evaluate really the level of adherence to inhaled steroids and the resulting contribution to study outcomes of the increased mortality they noted in the SMART study. Are there any other limitations of this study that you were able to identify? Well, one question that I had is the reason that they chose to do per-protocol analysis instead of intention-to-treat analysis. As I understand it, intention-to-treat analysis helps to reduce some of the bias that's associated with per-protocol analysis. So, I mean, that would be my main concern. The study was funded by Berengel Ingerheim, and Berengel Ingerheim were intimately involved in data collection, study design, and data analysis. And the authors acknowledge that they all take responsibility for the results of the study, and I'm glad to see that. But that was just one of the things that I would normally look at as a potential limitation. Well, the overall mean age of these patients makes this less applicable to the range of patients that, that we might see. The sponsorship of this study didn't necessarily bother me so much. When I look at the controls that were put in place, it seemed to me that it didn't really influence the results, although in the types of patients that were selected in order to make the effects of the program more beneficial should be considered. I always think that intention to treat is a good thing to look at in a clinical trial and see if that was done in this particular study, they had a really good success rate in terms of completion rate of patients. And so, again, I wasn't particularly disturbed by that. When we think about the applicability of this study to other people, a couple of things in the baseline characteristics that jumped out at me a little bit that I think we would at least give some consideration to is that 16 to 20 percent of patients were on theophylline. I don't think we're going to see that in our patients in the United States. The other thing I thought was kind of interesting, and it came out in the secondary outcomes, is that really the categories of severity of asthma that I would put these patients in, to me, weren't really reflected into instruments that they utilized. I mean, ACQ score were less than three. The range of that could be up to six. Those scores really weren't that bad at baseline. So basically, these were some subjects that were recruited in the study had pretty significant airflow obstruction in some cases and, you know, requiring courses of steroids throughout the year. But, you know, on a daily basis, when they're reporting their symptoms, they really weren't claiming or, you know, endorsing a lot of symptoms. 
The final question is, if we agree that this particular study had several limitations, how do we in fact treat our patients who are uncontrolled on combination inhaled corticosteroid therapy and long-acting beta-2 agonist therapy? I guess one thing I would say is that it's always good to have more options. Uh, it's useful to have this information because really we have a limited number of options in asthma therapy. The other thing that this study talks about a little bit is that maybe some of the other options that we have to go to aren't that beneficial in combinations like the addition of a leukotriene modifier. But again, I think that if I looked at maybe a younger patient with asthma who wasn't well controlled on, on what they were on and they had a strong history of atopic diseases like allergic rhinitis or eczema, that I would still think that maybe the addition of a leukotriene modifier on top of what they were already on might be beneficial, you know, in a one kind of study. When people look at the study, they need to realize that right now, it, this is not the theotropium delivery system that we use in the United States, and dose was a little bit different. And in that feature, I mean, when we start thinking about different inhalation devices across the board, I mean, this patient is going to be using two or three different types of inhalation devices, each of which has different instructions. And that's a very practical consideration as well. Yeah, I thoroughly agree with that. And one of the things we also have to consider is adherence. And the more devices, not just through the different techniques, but the more devices the patient's using, the less likely they are to cure it. And we don't have a combination inhaled steroid tiotropium inhaler at this point, which I think would be necessary if we're going to use it, unless we have the same problem potentially as what we've had with the long-acting beta agonists, as people masking their symptoms by using a bronchodilator in the absence of an inhaled steroid. I think inhaler technique are extremely critical. When a patient doesn't use their inhaler right, they have a good reason not to continue therapy, and we know that adherence is already very low in the asthma population. We should always be thinking about environmental control and not just drug therapy. So one of the things we need to do is keep focusing on patient education, collaborative interviewing techniques, and working with patient-centered treatment goals to make sure the patients understand how the adherence benefits them in ways that they can actually relate to. And I think that in addition to the leukotriene add-on therapy the dentist just talked about, we also need to consider in high users, like the frequent flyers to the emergency room and hospital for the atopic patient, the potential consideration of adding drugs such as emelizumab. Thanks again to Dr. Williams and Dr. Suclaris for their insight and commentary on the Primatine A asthma 1 and 2 trials. In summary, this trial showed that the addition of tiotropium to inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta-2 agonist therapy reduced the risk for exacerbations and improved lung function on spirometry. However, as pointed out, there are several limitations in this study that allow us to question if many of these patients may have had undiagnosed COPD that could have led to these favorable results. And perhaps for those patients who have mixed asthma and COPD, tiotropium therapy may be a reasonable therapeutic option. What are your thoughts about the Primatine A asthma trials? How should the evidence be applied to patient care? We would love to hear your thoughts and welcome your comments, and we want to know whether you plan to use tiotropium in your uncontrolled asthma patients. Thank you for viewing this CaptaCast and for your comments. This broadcast was brought to you by iForumRx, examining the evidence that informs ambulatory care practice.